extremely glad to be able to introduce Professor Simon Saunders, who's the president of BSPS. Thank you all, it's a great privilege to be here. The world is the totality of quantities, not of things. What does that remind you of? It was a hundred years ago that Wittgenstein signed off on the Tractatus and in Vienna, the city that put philosophy of science on the philosophical map. His slogan, the world is the totality of facts, not of things, followed at least by his own logic from his first sentence. The world is all that is the case. I don't have a first sentence prior to this one, <clears throat> and I don't have a first philosophy, nor do I seek one. My slogan is a reflection on the physical sciences today and on its history. But if I'm at all right in what I'm claiming, <clears throat> then there are implications for philosophy of science and for metaphysics. So my slogan, the world is the totality of quantities, not of things, meaning quantities come before objects. Objects are constructed out of quantities. Mathematics is the language of the physical sciences because it is the only language that we know that is articulate about quantities, that can define them in intricate ways and explore how they behave. I say quantities are everywhere, not just in fundamental physics. They are everywhere at the observable level as well. What are they? They are represented by functions with dimensional values, typically, mappings from some domain. What is this domain? It may be a finite collection of objects or a smooth manifold of points. In the latter case, the quantities are fields, or they may be certain degrees of freedom of fields. Their usual, their usual idiom is a system of partial differential equations or difference equations. So if I may anticipate the first and obvious objection, as such, are they not properties of points of space or space-time <clears throat> that are in effect objects prior to fields? Well, not if we are talking about classical fields, which I'm going to cover first. Quantum case is a bit different. Roughly speaking, classically, points of space or space-time are arrived at as constructions out of quantitative properties, out of values of fields. And similarly for functions defined on a domain of things, those things too are constructions out of quantities. I shall come back to this later. From quantities come quantitative properties and relations. And in terms of them, things defined implicitly as coincidences of quantitative values, and thence predications of things that may or may not fit reality. The fit is instantiation. Reality may, better or worse, instantiate a model in the Tarskian sense, according to which sentences are true. This is a kind of picturing, but as will become clear, it is not of the kind sought by Wittgenstein in the Tractatus. Picturing is representing. It is a major theme of much contemporary philosophy of science, particularly structuralism in its various forms. But I insist the fit is better or worse, by that meaning not that there is some unique correct picturing, and we may or may not have the correct model, the true set of sentences, for the world is not primarily a world of things at all. I mean, even having a complete and final theory in the way that physicists think of these things, there will be several different systems of sentences at several levels, instantiated better or worse, with more or less precision, more or less informative, each depicting a world of things. That seems to me to make a notion of isomorphism between reality and set theory untenable. When is an approximation good enough? Wittgenstein in the Fours noted that the understanding of everyday language is enormously complicated. And we know he despaired 10 years later of finding his simples on which his picture theory depended. His later philosophy focused on usage of language and not abstractions. I am with the later Wittgenstein and with Quine. I have no more substantive an account of representation or reference than is provided by use of language. There's a dog, there's a molecule, there's a black hole, differ in complexity, but not in kind. Talk of picturing and instantiation is derivative on representation and reference by language in use. But let me add also perception, a point I should come back to. <clears throat> 
There is nothing simple or obvious or straightforward about reference to dogs, but we do manage it. In the same way we manage reference to molecules and black holes, things only indirectly observable. Arthur Fine made this point a long time ago. It is the natural ontological attitude, and almost everything in physics is indirectly observable, except possibly, and sadly if so, superstrings. <laughs> a further objection. Cannot quantities themselves occupy object position and predicates? Do they not, in my very words, as I speak to you now? So are not quantities things? Of course we can speak of them in this way, of electricity, momentum, mass, as things. And this is not so unfamiliar. It is likewise for butter, air, and milk. Grammatically, the words are mass terms. Strangely, mass itself has the plural masses, so it's not purely a mass term, a harbinger of ambiguities to come. But as mass terms, with no further qualification, what do they denote? Following Quine, milk is milk everywhere, a thing with scattered parts, and likewise butter, and initially, mama. Mass, electricity, momentum are more of a stretch, but then hardly part of our first entry into language. This slide between quantities and things that have quantity, between a field of some quantity, a field of force, of charge, of mass, and the field of substance, was once important to physics. Think of ether theory. And it is still important in philosophy of science. Think of Loudon's critique of convergent realism. I shall come back to this shortly. The distinction between quantities and things is further blurred in quantum theory because quantities are discretized. As such, they are integral valued. Are they numbers of things or just discrete values of quantities? The ambiguity was already present in Planck's words on announcing his historic discovery in relation to the black body distribution law for the energy density of radiation in equilibrium with matter. Resonators, he called the matter and modeled them as simple harmonic oscillators. He considered how energy was to be distributed over a number C of resonators for a given frequency. This is what he said. If E is regarded as infinitely divisible, an infinite number of different distributions is possible. We, however, consider, and this is the essential point, E to be composed of a determinate number of equal finite parts and employ in their determination the natural constant H. This constant, multiplied by the frequency of the resonator, yields the energy element in ergs. Divide E by H, we obtain the number n of energy elements. What are they? Things or discrete energies of modes. For Planck, it was fairly clear it was a way of performing a computation, a calculation of the entropy of the resonators in thermal equilibrium with radiation at a given temperature and frequency. It was a calculated quantity to be compared with a measurable one, the energy density of black body radiation. Perhaps he did not understand how radical the implications of that calculation were, the method of calculation. As for the quanta at a given frequency, whether they are things or aggregated the quantity of radiation or at that frequency, quantity of energy, and generalizing quantity of charge and mass, it is all grist to my mill, for either way, they are derivative on quantities. What Planck discovered was not Arithmos mechanica, number mechanics. It was aptly called quantum. A concession. If by quantities I mean substances, well, how many substances are there? Well, there are the flavors of quarks, the flavors of leptons, the gauge gluons, other gauge bosons, the Higgs, the antiparticles. There may be supersymmetric partners, but I'm going to go for 42. <laughs> The world is the totality, if you like, of 42 things. And another concession, as noted, quantities, most quantities, have dimension. And a quantitative property says of the quantity that it takes a certain value or range of values. <clears throat> that then becomes a predication also of things. To specify the latter, a comparison is needed with some other value of that quantity or some other quantity with the same dimension. 
Metaphysicians have seen this as ultimately depending on a system of units, and worse, on measurement procedures involving some concrete particular, the proverbial platinum bar in the Paris vault. Rightly, they view that with suspicion, and if we consider the quantities in themselves, so-called absolutism about quantities, it has seemed to many that they are unknowable. They recommend beginning with purely qualitative properties instead, and defining quantitative properties in terms of these, mainly through representation theorems. In fact, the meter rule in the Paris vault disappeared long ago, or rather went into a museum. There remains, however, the international prototype kilogram, or IPK, and its various replicas. Here it is. And here is one of the five national prototype kilogram artifacts, as they are called, held by the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the US. So this one is K92. It's been held by Eddie Mulhern in the appropriate way, <laughs> appropriately dressed. <laughs> they call particle detectors the modern day cathedrals. Well, here is our modern day relic and our priestly robes <clears throat> for handling it. Alas, its days too are numbered. It is to be retired. And since it is the last of its kind, it will be the philosophical equivalent of a kind of genocide. This November, as presently scheduled, a project that has been more than a decade in the making, the IPK will be replaced by the kibble balance, in effect, an enormously sophisticated current balance that also measures the local gravitational field. Here it is. Double the mass of everything overnight, but keep the fundamental dimensional constants the same, and this balance will pick up the difference. Rescale the constants as well, and of course nothing will have been changed. We see it as not concrete particulars that are needed for a system of units, but a particular dynamical form, if I can put it in Howard Stein's terms, a particular kind of dynamical interaction in a highly controlled way, rather than an interaction with a particular thing. Bound states in low energy quantum mechanics that involve a thing only in the way that they involve some of the 42 things, as do we all, are examples of dynamical forms in Stein's sense. They are codified in the periodic table. And most stable of all, the proton, a certain bound state in QCD. Ratios of other masses with the proton mass, the ratio of one quantity with another within a single dynamical model, are conceptually simple and under mathematical control. As for absolutism about quantities, the very contrast with comparativism has broken down. None of this was known when systems of units were devised, and when it was known, it was of little immediate use. What was used, and already in place long before the discovery of quantum mechanics, was the mole as a measure of mass, the total mass of a certain number of atoms of a given kind, Avogadro's number. Take carbon. The carbon atom is a particular dynamical form, a particular stable bound state of nucleons and electrons, and ultimately a bound state of quantum fields. If we could count the atoms individually and use them as a balance, that would do even better than Kibble's device. I say better because, of course, Avogadro's number, 10 to the 19, is uh, you count every single one of them. That's one part in 10 to the 19. The Kibble device, I think, is getting up to one part in 10 to the 10. There is much more to say on this matter, for example, in terms of renormalization theory and the relation between the tangible quantities that we measure and the dimensional quantities and the dimensional constants that enter the field equations. Well, we have a fantastic session tomorrow afternoon on renormalization theory. Joshua Rosala, Robert Hollander, Vincent Andorrell, Sebastian Rivet. I will be there. Where do we stand with my slogan about quantities, my quantity realism for short? I may, now, I may by now have added so many qualifications that those who initially thought I was intent on defending an absurdly revisionist metaphysics will perhaps conclude I have nothing new to say. If so, I'm encouraged up to a point. Philosophy is, is at its best when it teeters between the banal and the insane. I'll try to keep it up. In that spirit, I also hold that we begin with quantities in sensory stimulation, and our entire object-centered mode of language is in reaction to sensory stimuli, namely quantities, 
I'm channeling Quine, not Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein attended to the complications and muddles in words that particularly afflict philosophers. Quine attended to the complications and sensations in how they first give rise to words that particularly afflict little children. No wonder they have something in common. Children are often very philosophical. Let me place Quine himself at the end of what he called his, the milestones of empiricism. This philosophical hinterland is enormous. And another thought, can there be muddles in sensation or illusions? Is there a primary secondary quantity distinction? Should we conclude if we follow Quine and grant that objects are in effect posited on the basis of sensory stimuli, that for that reason objects are parochial, a kind of Kantian form, not space and time, but thinginess, to which nature must conform if it is nature for us. I would resist that move if I thought that scientific theories should be put into first order logical theories, as did Quine, theories in the logical sense, closed systems of equations, uh, closed systems of sentences. So what if the predicate calculus has its origins in our animal natures? Perhaps all our mathematics has its origins there as well. We must use some prism, true, but there is as yet no reason to think it must mislead or in other ways be limited. But if I am right that quantities are prior to things and are what the sciences concern, there is no reason to think it should succeed either. I mean succeed to perfection. The predicate calculus may in some circumstances be the wrong prism, inflexible in the way that Euclidean geometry proved too inflexible for Kant or Kantian philosophy. To illustrate, quantum logic as a non-Boolean lattice theory may be more useful in understanding quantum things in terms of predication and perhaps even of reference. It does not mean a difference in logic in the sense of what is needed for mathematical reasoning. But what I do think follows if we are Quinians is that if we are projecting a world of everyday things on the basis of sensory stimulation, and that is just a physical fact, and if the further projection to unordinary things investigated by science takes place in anything like a similar way, admittedly this is by no means established, then scientific investigation is very like perception, as Kuhn, among others, maintained. And if that is true, to stop short at facts about the everyday, including facts about positions and needles on dials, to be indifferent to the fruits of that perception is not a philosophy of science at all. It is to mistake the enterprise in its most basic feature. Limiting perceptions to ordinary things, among which I include ordinary events, means limiting it to directly observable things and events. Bas van Frassen was sensitive to this criticism, but dismissed it on the grounds that whatever else there may be, sense data do not exist. That seems to me to miss the mark. Whether or not there are sense data, there are sensory stimuli. Rather, he must argue that observable data in relation to the indirectly observable is unlike sensory stimulus in relation to the observable. How this argument is to proceed he has given us no clue. Well, that marks my overview. For the rest of my talk, I want to concentrate on certain aspects. Let me give you a picture of where we've got to. Uh, so at the center is quantities. I've discussed units moving up on the left-hand side to quantitative properties. That's what I want to speak more on. I've spoken of predication and language as theory. And I've spoken of Quine and his milestones of empiricism. Something else about this diagram, the top is more classical, at the bottom is quantum, at the bottom there's going to be representation too. In fact, the thing wraps around, and it's going to wrap around from left to right as well. We have Quine's milestones of empiricism. I want to focus on history of science. Recall my early claim. Mathematics, as it is used in the physical sciences, is mainly to do with quantities and in this sense is fit for a world of quantities. The sciences of antiquity, the only ones by a long shot 
that qualified as normal sciences in Kuhn's sense were astronomy, statics, harmony, optics, and mathematics, meaning geometry, meaning the science, the geometric science of things. It was the science of spatial magnitudes. But what those things were, over and above instantiating a system of geometrical quantities, did not matter. These fields, uniquely in, Greco, in the Greco-Roman world, became the objects of research traditions defined by vocabularies and techniques inaccessible to the layperson. Even today, Ptolemy's Almagest and Archimedes' floating bodies can be read only by those with developed technical expertise. I have just been quoting Kuhn, more or less. Kuhn in the essential tension, not structure who made the further point that those who made contributions in one of these fields tended to make contributions in several of the others. Euclid, for example, wrote a treatise on harmonics. It was superseded by Ptolemy's. The skills were transferable, a pattern that was still in evidence right up into the 20th century. Once one learns the language of the Book of Nature, one can read all its chapters. Until recently, there are simply too many. The medieval period added to the classical sciences a similarly sophisticated research tradition in ballistics and projectiles, but just the one. The great achievement at Oxford and at my own college, Merton, by the Oxford calculators was an algebra, s equals half a t squared, results wrongly attributed to Galileo almost two centuries later. <laughs> What can you do? But Galileo was the great exponent of ballistics of his time, appointed to the chair of mathematics at the age of 46 at the University of Pisa, 1589, with most of his discoveries still before him. Well, that gives us hope we pass the age of 30 or 40 <laughs> and even 50. It was, of course, Galileo who said the book of nature was written in the language of mathematics, but this was the age of mechanistic reasoning and not just mathematical, and of the new Baconian sciences. Mechanical explanations and speculation over mechanisms for imagining heat, light, and the behavior of gases and fluids as newly discovered, and of course also gravity, were entirely qualitative. They were also easily accessible, and as such debated by any and every gentleman of leisure. Essays on mechanisms were to be found alongside writings on art, fashion, and geographical exploration in all the journals of the day, including the transactions of the Royal Society. And so they were until late in the 18th century. Descartes' magnum opus, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, was nothing of the kind, containing no mathematics to speak of. It was filled with qualitative mechanistic picturing and showed itself satisfied with any simple and pleasing conception of phenomena in terms of mechanical motions and contact forces. Newton's mathematical principles, in contrast, opposed the mechanical philosophy root and branch. It demonstrated the same virtuoso control over calculated quantities as had Archimedes, Ptolemy, and Euclid, and, I might add, the Merton mathematicians. To the victor go the spoils, receive history among them. But we miss an essential dimension to Newton's achievement in Principia if we do not hear the dissenting voices, not on the grounds of the unintelligibility of action at a distance, we're all familiar with that, but on the grounds that the mathematization of phenomena as shown in Principia was inappropriate to its subject matter. Thus, Privat de Moliere, in defending the vortex theory in 1733, granted the vortices may only approximately obey the inverse square law, but hazarded that will simply be more in conformity with the astronomical observations whenever those come in, and that the mechanical forces of the vortex give us the astronomical laws as they are in effect with a better precision than the purely metaphysical forces of Newton, which give those laws with too much geometrical precision. These were words defended approvingly by Bernard de Fontenelle, permanent secretary, secretary to the L'Académie des Sciences, and no mathematician. Monsieur Lab de Bollier astutely criticizes Newton on his extreme precision. <laughs> 
Aristotle, who did not contribute to the classical sciences in, antiqu in antiquity, remarked that the minute accuracy of mathematics is not to be demanded of all things, but only in the case of things that have no matter. Quite a restraint. Thus the Abbe Nolle warned, it is dangerous for a physicist to develop too great a taste for geometry. Danny Diderot concurred, writing that in the space of a month, the Principia could have been simplified. In this way, have saved three years of labor spent by a thousand good-spirited fellows interested in understanding Newton's discoveries. Only three years? David Hume sought to introduce only the experimental method of reasoning into morals, not the mathematical. He would, agreed, he would have agreed with Moliere, geometry is a rough approximation and no guarantee of truth, possessed of general empirical adequacy at best. And on the other side, Yves Gingras, in his recent illuminating study, of which I've been borrowing, considers the case of Leonard Euler, committed to a hydrodynamical conception of gravity, and one might think sympathetic to mechanical explanations. Yet when Cadwallon de Colden published a book explaining Newton's gravity theory with the layman in mind, Euler took the trouble, in the words of Colden's uh, biographer, to mercilessly pull the book to pieces. He said that Colden ignored the first principles of hydrostatic and that this entirely disqualifies the author from establishing the true forces requisite to the motion of the planets from whatever cause he may attempt to derive them. Of his own attempts at arrival to Newton's theory, he wrote to Lassage, the theory of fluid movement is not enough studied yet to produce a complete explanation. What was needed was an adequate system of equations. They, and they alone, gave proof of concept. Anything less wasn't even wrong. Those, like Michael Faraday, without mathematical training, were the exceptions that proved the rule. It may be supposed that one who has little or no mathematical knowledge should hardly assume a right to judge of the generality and force of the principle of gravitation, wrote Faraday in an essay filled with errors, but yet with his famous lines of force. It elicited in a review by Ernst Brucker the remark, it is a long time since such a far-reaching physical question has been touched upon wholly without the aid of mathematical apparatus, without the assistance of those wonder-working symbols whose brief rhetoric speaks more convincingly to the mind than the tongue of Cicero or Demosthenes. Only the year before, Maxwell, in his inaugural lecture on appointment to the chair of natural philosophy in Aberdeen, in 1856, I think he was all of 24 years old. Natural philosophy is and ought to be mathematics. That is, the science in which laws relating to quantity are treated according to the principles of accurate reasoning. He said the same word for word in his inaugural lecture for his brief sojourn at King's College London in 1860. Nine years later, his essay on the mathematical classification of physical quantities began with the words, the first part of the growth of a physical science consists in the discovery of a system of quantities on which its phenomena may be conceived to depend. The next stage is the discovery of the mathematical form of the relations between these quantities. After this, the science may be treated as a mathematical science, and the verification of the laws is affected by a theoretical investigation of the conditions under which certain quantities can be most accurately measured, followed by an experimental realization of these conditions and actual measurement of the quantities. Not bad as a definition of the physical sciences. This is the same Maxwell who came out of retirement at the age of 39, he was coming out of retirement. Maxwell was extraordinary. To take up the directorship of the experimental laboratory as Cavendish Professor of Physics, newly created in Cambridge in 1871. This is what he said. It is not till we attempt to bring the theoretical part of our training into contact with the practical that we begin to experience the full effect of what Faraday has called mental inertia. Not only the difficulty of recognizing among the concrete objects before us the abstract relation which we have learned from books, but the distractive, distracting pain of wrenching the mind away from the symbols to the objects and from the objects back to the symbols. <laughs> 
This, however, is the price we have to pay for new ideas. But when we have overcome these difficulties and successfully bridged over the gulf between the abstract and the concrete, it is not a mere piece of knowledge that we have obtained. We have acquired the rudiment of a permanent mental endowment. I say again, quantities are all around us. Maxwell delighted in speaking of the perception of quantities in the everyday, their independences in ordinary processes and things. All experimental research, he emphasized, involve the identification and measurement of quantities. The wrenching the mind away was from things to quantities and back again. Given all of this, what of the electromagnetic field itself, the dynamical quantities par excellence in Maxwell's time? In his famous Ether article in Encyclopedia Britannica, he considered the phenomenon of the interference of light, in effect, the two-slit experiment. He noted that beams of light following different paths brought to interfere can produce darkness, where if only one is present, there is light. I quote, Now we cannot suppose that two bodies, when put together, can annihilate each other. Therefore light cannot be a substance. What we have proved is that one portion of light can be the exact opposite of another portion. Among physical quantities, we find some which are capable of having their signs reversed and others which are not. Thus a displacement in one direction is the exact opposite of an equal displacement in the opposite direction. Such quantities are the measures not of substances, but always of processes taking place in a substance. We therefore conclude that light is not a substance, but a process going on in a substance. I'll put those words up for those who wish to ponder them. If you feel Maxwell was essentially correct in this reasoning, that neither bodies nor substances, when put together, can annihilate, then you will find incomprehensible the idea that the electromagnetic field, classically conceived, could be a substance in its own right. Does anybody here think that? Which, that it could be a substance or not? that he was essentially correct in his reasoning. Conversely, if not, and if you are prepared to elide process with substance needed to dispense with ether, then you have the key to unfettered use of systems of equations without the suggestion of a parallel research program or investigation into a medium other than field that satisfies those equations. Where do we see this today in physics? Above all else, where do we see it today? In quantum mechanics and in the need for some substratum, <coughs> a separate in, uh, uh, research program of investigation. Maxwell elsewhere was more circumspect. According to his biographer, P.M. Harmon, he upheld a disjunction between the nature of substances and the framework of dynamical principles. He asserted the sufficiency of a purely symbolic or functional mode of representation. He relied in his treaties on deriving equations by Lagrangian variations rather than on a theory of ether. His method, in Joseph Lemoore's words, was to ignore or leave out of account altogether the details of the mechanisms, whatever it is, that is an operation in the phenomenon under discussion. But Maxwell, insisting that substances cannot cancel out, showed himself a transitional figure. I have written before of the ether theory as at bottom an attempt to ground, explain, or otherwise derive Fresnel's equations and Maxwell's field equations from Newtonian principles. In that sense, Einstein's undermining of Newtonian principles was really needed to finally banish ether. But Lorentz and others had already given up on that project by the turn of the century and were happy, as was Einstein, well, Einstein was worried about thermal equilibrium, but was happy to think of the quantity obeying the Maxwell-Lorentz equations as directed and subsisting in its own right. Why not a directed field at each point of space? The case of the optical and later electromagnetic ether is of importance because among the mathematical sciences, it is the strongest simple example in, in Loudon's refutation of convergent realism. If the story that I am telling is correct, it takes on a different light. It is a step on the way to convergence 
on quantity realism instead. I'm indicating it in my pictogram. It, so the, it is a link from the history and ether to quantitative properties, the electromagnetic field as substance, and from there to structure. Okay, so let me more briefly fill in the steps of how these quantitative properties and relations determine objects, rather than objects, the properties and relations. I'm zooming in on, on this part of my pictogram. For a simple example, take a many particle system whose dynamics is defined by equations for relative distances and angles, quantities both. Then we may define quantitative properties and relations in terms of ranges and values of relative distances and so on. But we also find in these equations for relative distances and angles that we use coordinate systems as well, or individuating fields in John Stachel's terminology. The great German mathematician and physicist Karl Neumann, who did as much as Mach, if not more, to revive foundational studies in Newton's theory of gravity and mechanics more generally, spoke of an intermediate variable and interchangeably an intermediate quantity. I quote, it is expedient and sometimes necessary to specify the relationship which each of the given variables has to this intermediate quantity, both in mathematical and in physical investigations. And then he explicitly compared it to Newton's absolute space. These intermediate quantities are coordinates, their values points. In speaking of material bodies A and B, we use predicates. A is located at point Q, which is distance R from B at P. Now, I have long championed the view that only invariant predications are physically real in this business of constructing bodies or talk of objects. Only invariant predications can be used, invariant under the mathematical symmetries of the equations, if any, governing the quantities of which they are de de defined. For a theory in which translations of material particles relative to space are symmetries, that poses a problem. Predications like A is located at, at point Q, or A is R from P, are not invariant when bodies are translated relative to space. But the statement, there exists x such that a is at x, or there exists x and y such that a is at x, a distance r from b at y, are invariant. And as open predicates applied to material bodies, they are invariant predicates. Moreover, they involve ineliminable use of bound quantification. Without that, there would be no invariance. Precisely Quine's criterion for ontological commitment. Ergo, in making statements of this kind, we are committed to the existence of points of space as constructed objects out of quantitative properties, admittedly in my example, leveraging off of relations to material bodies. But the example goes over immediately to the so-called whole argument of general relativity and yields quantification over manifold points as embedded in predicates assigning coincidences among gravitational field values and in relation to coincidences of values of matter fields, the latter now playing the role of the material bodies in my earlier construction. In this reconstruction project, how do I know, if I have only quantitative properties and relations to go on, that I have one thing, or ten things, or a countable infinity of things, all with exactly the same properties and relations? It is an old problem, the problem of the number of angels, species in firma, that can occupy a point in space. How many angels can dance on the point of a pin? Posed in these terms, the answer when it comes to atoms is to appeal to impenetrability. But the problem is more general, as the example of species in firma shows, and not so far from the idea of dynamical forms. Perhaps those, they too can coincide. Logically, the appeal to impenetrability works because it is an irreflexive relation. If x and y satisfy x does not occupy the same position as y, then x cannot be the same as y. This is to ground non-identity in a quantitative relation, x and y as non-zero distance apart, an irreflexive quantitative relation as well. But this was not obvious until recently. Let me give some background. 
Shortly following Gödel's axiomatization of the identity relation in his proof of the completeness of the predicate calculus in 1929, Hilbert and Bernays showed that a definition would suffice instead. It is not quite Leibniz's, X and Y are the same if they have all the same properties, because it allows of relations and predicates of any arity as well. Of course, Leibniz famously did not countenance relations. Let, let me show it explicitly. So here, the top left, is the Hilbert and Banais definition. If we have a, an infinite alphabet, there's a difficulty, but who works with an infinite alphabet? The problem is that the predicates, f here, has many open variables. So if this is to be satisfied, it must also be the case that on quantification over those variables is satisfied. This seems uh, quite powerful. It gives rise in particular to so-called relational properties, and that certainly went further than Leibniz. But it's not powerful enough in the face of sufficient symmetry, as witness Max Black's two spheres of iron, one mile apart, in an otherwise empty space. Each has the same properties and relational properties as the other. But Black and other philosophers on identity were missing something. There is another kind of biconditional, quantifying over free variables in the definition, namely of this kind. Not only must S and T have the same relational properties, they must bear the same relations to everything. But this isn't true of Black's two spheres. Black's two spheres do not bear the same relations to everything, as just look at what happens when the value Y takes the value, when the variable Y takes the value S, and F is the predicate one mile apart. The difference is quite subtle, and for a while it foxed even Quine. But it is the crucial condition that is not satisfied in most of the philosophically well-known supposed counterexamples to the principle of identity of indiscernibles. I mention this history because the jury is still out. I say there is a viable principle of identity of indiscernibles, according to which there is only so much numerical diversity as is required by predicative distinctions. It is viable in the sense that it delivers more or less what is needed. It conforms to Goodman's maxim. It underwrites inferences that we are prepared to accept and rejects those we are willing to amend. No more. It can make changes on the edges. It works for spatial points in Euclidean space and Max Black's two spheres. It works for manifold points. Well, if topological features of the manifold count as relations. It works for fermions. It works for composite bosons. Whether it works for elementary bosons like photons is not so clear. So Fred Muller and I are still working on it. <laughs> Where are you, Fred? <laughs> Jeremy, you're working too. And Adam, we, uh, this remains an interesting program, I think. What then is the status of the PII? And now Thomas Muller Nielsen, is he here? has worked on this. As a principle for constructing objects out of quantities, it is a methodological device, like Occam's razor, or one of Kant's regulative principles. But that only makes sense if objects are not fundamental. For if they are, why should they satisfy the PII? But if objects are not fundamental, if they are of greater or lesser definition and thereby utility, then there is no higher court than pragmatic convenience. There is no reason to think that there is just one way that reification of objects can go either, no more than in Quine's epistemology, given the totality of sensory stimuli. There is underdetermination in both, even when all of the physical equations are fixed once and for all. Now that topic leads on to another. What qualifies two samples of a substance as same substance? In terms of Quine's sense of the totality of scattered parts, in what sense, how do we know, that these parts, themselves substances, are the same? So not quite the question posed by the principle of identity of indiscernibles, which is when do they differ? Posed like this, the question seems philosophical. All the more surprising then that we find it is crucial to the definition of physically measurable quantities. One quantity in particular is particularly sensitive to the question, the equilibrium entropy of a homogeneous substance. If two substances differ and interact only weakly, each has an equilibrium entropy as defined by the macrostate, approximately the same as if the other is not there. 
And the same is true of the entropy change of the two substances. It is the sum of the entropy change of each taken individually, as if the other were not there. However, this is not the case when the substances are the same, on pain of violating the extensivity of the entropy function. The latter is, is the requirement that the entropy of a homogeneous substance can be considered the sum of the entropy of its parts, like particle number, mass, energy, and volume. Pressure, temperature, and chemical potential, by contrast, are intensive quantities that do not scale with the size of the system. But how can the entropy change of the whole not be the sum of the change in its parts when the substances are entirely non-interacting? They may be samples of the same ideal gas of non-interacting molecules. Well, this is not the usual way of introducing the Gibbs paradox, for that is what it is called, but it is historically accurate. Let me put it, uh, let me put it in to my pictogram. And here is the great man. Pierre Duhem was the first to use the term paradox, citing Carl Newman, he who with Mach revived the study and the foundations of mechanics. Gibbs treated of the entropy of mixing in his On the Equilibrium of Heterogeneous Substances of 1875 to 76, spread over 200 pages of the memoirs of the Academy of Connecticut. It was the Principia of thermodynamics. Among them was Gibbs' law of mixing. I have already stated it. The entropy change on the mixing of distinct non-interacting substances is the sum of the entropy change of each as if the other were not there. OK, let me look at this in more detail. This is for distinct gases. Since distinct, we may suppose that there is a semi-permeable membranes, MA and MB. MA is pervious to A but not to B, and the other one vice versa. So then the gas A expands doing work on MB. Uh, gas B expands doing work on the piston moving to the left. The process can be as slow as you like and at constant temperature, so is reversible. From the de thermodynamic definition of the entropy change for a reversible process, the integral of the heat, heat flow divided by the temperature, it will just equal that mechanical work if that process is at constant temperature. The work is positive. The entropy must increase. But when the gases are the same, there are no such membranes. Whether or not there is entropy change cannot be directly measured. Might there really be a change nonetheless? So A and B may be viewed as independent after all at the price of extensivity. For most, extensivity is sacrosanct. For most have taken the Gibbs paradox to consist not so much in this lack of independence as that it is all or nothing. What determines that it is all or nothing? What physically does it mean to say the substances are the same? The difficulty seemed so acute that it elicited this comment from Oscar Wiederberg. The paradoxical consequences of the entropy mixing formula start to occur only when we follow Gibbs in imagining gases that are infinitely different, little different from each other in every respect, and thus conceive the case of identical gases as the continuous limit of the general case of different gases. On the contrary, we may well conclude that finite differences of the properties belong to the essence of what we call matter. That was in 1894. It was not so much prophetic as in keeping with atomism, albeit unpopular in Germany at the time. His supervisor uh, was one of the few atomists of Germany in the late 19th century. Uh, Gibbs did not have an answer to the discontinuity puzzle. In the century since, and particularly among the Dutch school of Ehrenfest, Van Kampen, and most recently Dieks, and likewise the information theoretic school of Jaynes, Quantum theory has nothing to do with it. It is a matter of operational distinctions, change of information, not microphysical ones. There is no puzzle about operational distinctions being yes or no, of mixing or no, of change of information or no. As Van Kampen put it, whether such a process is reversible or not depends on how discriminating the observer is. The expression for the entropy depends on whether or not he is able and willing to distinguish between the molecules A and B. This is a paradox only for those 
who attach more physical reality to the entropy than is implied by its definition. But this response echoes another. There is no puzzle about what is a measurement, either operationally construed in quantum mechanics, or when a measurement is performed. This is a paradox only for those who attach more physical reality to the wave function than is implied by its definition. I shall come back to this at the end. On the discontinuity puzzle, I have a different suggestion. It is not a matter of operational distinctions, but dynamical ones. They come first. They will determine what is operationally possible. It is a question of how the substance is dynamically defined. For simple gases, this does amount to Wiedeberg's idea. Bound states of atoms, all of the same kind. Same is now same solution to the equations have exactly and have exactly the same quantitative properties as a result. And those properties directly dictate how those atoms interact with all other atoms and with external fields. But pushing back against Wiedeberg, some such quantitative properties can change continuously. For example, polarizations of molecules, as pointed out by Lande. The key question, however, of two collections of molecules, exactly the same but differing in polarization, is whether that polarization can be a dynamical player, of whether it could be used, for example, in some local physics, by way of a semi-permeable membrane that could reversibly separate the two kinds of molecules. In short, how stable is the polarization? Can it determine a difference in dynamical interactions? Is there an effective Hamiltonian in a given regime and an effective state space structure in terms of which molecules of one polarization behave differently from molecules of the other? Those are the relevant questions. But it is easy to see how this is very far from an all or nothing affair. We are talking of emergent descriptions based on emergent dynamical properties, certain degrees of freedom whose values are approximately frozen in a given regime so as to define an effective dynamics. They can all fade away. That structure can disappear, continuously disappear. <clears throat> Well, if I keep going with the wrong tone of voice, I imagine I'll put my audience to sleep, for there's nothing to elicit a negative reaction. But then you are buying into my quantity realism and the priority of quantities over things, and I'm not confident that you do. I come back to the lack of independence of the two substances when they are the same. How is it, if all the interactions are negligible, that the presence of the other makes a difference and they cannot be treated independently? Let me give you Gibbs' solution. It has been widely dismissed or ignored, and Gibbs himself was unable to defend it. It appeared in 1902. He died unexpectedly the following year. It's rather a slander that Jaynes suggested that he was ailing and unwell when he wrote his Elements of Statistical Mechanics. To put it in its most simple terms, I shall use the so-called Boltzmann entropy the logarithm of the available phase space volume. And aside, how can the structure of state space be something measurable? In this case, the equilibrium entropy. It is a fascinating question. Eric Curiel will tell us tomorrow about state space's modal structure. Perhaps there are modal quantities that can be measured as well. I will be there. Friday. Oh, it's Friday. Oh, good. OK. The relation between entropy and phase space volume is inscribed on Boltzmann's gravestone, but it was first written down by Planck. This volume is what Planck found a new way to calculate using Planck's constant to coarse grain phase space. He didn't understand it to be what he was doing, but that's what he was doing. But I want to push the priority of quantities of things not just in quantum terms, where I believe my case is much stronger, but classically. Consider again when A and B are the same. Then if entropy is the logarithm of available phase space volume, it should go up on mixing. Because when the partition is removed, there are new microstates available, say when it is an A-type molecule on the right side, previously only occupied by the B-type molecule. These newly available microstates imply an increase in entropy. But now it seems that precisely the same should be true if the A-type and the B-type are the same. 
That is, that classically, there should always be an entropy of mixing and no extensivity. Witness Dennis Deeks in a recent paper where the two volumes are initially the same and a volume V. Before the partition is removed, the number of available states per particle is V, the total phase space volume then V to the power N. After the partition has been removed, the number of available states per particle is 2V. The reason is that after the partition's removal, it has become possible for the particles to move to the other chamber. The doubling of the number of available microstates thus expresses a physical freedom that was not present before the partition was taken away. Trajectories in space-time have become possible from the particles' initial states to states in the other chamber. Particles from the left and right sides can physically exchange their states. And on this basis, he, he argued, there is always an entropy of mixing. <clears throat> well, let's consider this more carefully. So here's a space-time diagram. On the left, the two chambers, the partition is in place and it stays in place throughout. On the right, the partition is removed at time t primed, as indicated by the red line. Correspondingly, there are trajectories possible on the right-hand side that are not possible on the left. Particles from A can go into the region B and vice versa. Now, I've drawn seven trajectories, and the crucial feature in my drawing, uh, I've done it as carefully as I can, is that at time t2, there are exactly the same positions and velocities on the left as on the right, only differing in whether it is a molecule from A or from B that has them. Now I ask you, is the state at T2 the same in the two cases? Let me simplify. <clears throat> I haven't bothered to draw the partition, but we just have the Gibbs paradox for two particles. On the left, each stays within its region, A or B. On the right, they cross over. Is the final state in the two cases the same? If it is, there is no entropy of mixing. It is not that new states are available when the partition is removed because of the possibility of particle exchange. It is rather that the same states can now be approached in a different way. If conversely, the two states are not the same, then there is an entropy of mixing, even when the molecules are identical. I'd quite like a show of hands. <laughs> Who thinks the states are the same? Who thinks they are not the same? Who's confused? <laughs> you can pose the same question in quantum mechanics, or indeed, let's just go for metaphysics. Suppose you have two lumps of clay. I had to get it in. One lump is a cube, and the other lump is a sphere. They're sitting side by side. The sphere slowly turns into a cube, and the cube into a sphere, as they slowly rotate around each other so as to take up each other's position at the end. At the end, each takes the place of the other, so you once again have a cube and a sphere. It, they look just the same, but is it the same? So I'm taking that quantities are prior, and the molecules are built up from quantitative properties and nothing else, then the two states are the same. Let me put it in its most paradoxical terms. Even though each of two things is changed, the two things are unchanged. Okay, that is what I am committed to and what the solution to Gibbs paradox is committed to. And this is what Gibbs himself act advocated. Uh, from a technical point of view, it was to quotient out by the permutations. That forces the equivalence of these two states. The lack of independence consists only in this. The possible states of the two particles is not determined by the product of the possible states of each taken independently. The state of the two is defined by the state as something that supervenes on them both. The whole imaginative, intuitive way of thinking of a collection of particles as each independently assigned a different microstate, the balls from the urn, is deficient, and the picture of probability that goes with it too. This point has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It is not even new to my history. I come back to Isaac Newton and the comparatively recently discovered De Gravitatione, the manuscript, or to give it its full name, De Gravitatione et Equip 
forgive my Latin, equipondio fluidorum, on gravity and the equilibrium of fluids. It began with a systematic attack on Descartes' fundamental distinction between thinking substances and extended substance and the outline of a new metaphysics of space. Space, Newton contended, has its own manner of existence that fits neither substances nor accidents. That may seem to go against my quantity view, but actually it supports it. If I have allowed space to count as a substance, the prototype to field, it is partly because with the advent of general relativity, it acquired that hallmark of substance that Newton thought space lacked, that it can act upon things. And returning for a moment to electromagnetism, of course it is a hallmark of light that may qualify it as substance. I also take satisfaction from the fact that reference to points of Newton's absolute space is easily accommodated in the quantity view prior to being shown to have its own dynamical degrees of freedom. We first made reference to something thinking it uniform. We later learned that it was non-uniform and that it could dynamically act. But it is Newton's proposal on material bodies that I want to highlight. He asked that we agree that God, by the sole action of thinking and willing, can prevent a body from penetrating any space defined by certain limits. But if you accept that this is so, it is a small step to granting that the space thus rendered impenetrable may change from moment to moment so that the region of impenetrability moves around as well. So suppose that God renders two such regions impenetrable, one a cube and one a sphere. Are there two ways of doing this? As thinking of them as lumps of clay, there is a choice as to which lump is the cube and which lump is the sphere. Many of you will recognize the great irony here, for it was Samuel Clarke who raised a similar question in his famous correspondence with Leibniz and in more acute form. Two ways of creating not a sphere and a cube, but two identical spheres. Not in anticipation of its denial, but in the certainty that it is true that there are two ways in which it can be done. And it was granted as true by Leibniz in contradiction to his principle of sufficient reason. But, surprise, modus tollens operates instead. Leibniz concluded there could be no two such created things. Clark was no mathematician. Leibniz was, but had his own alternative mathematization of the world to the one pursued by Newton. I doubt that Newton vetted Clark's replies with any care. There were too many other lapses in them. And alas, if he did vote, if he did note their reliance on scholastic notions, if damaging to Leibniz, he probably didn't care. I conclude with that other long-standing paradox of physics, the measurement paradox, and I have very little time. How much time do I have? So you're about two minutes over at the moment. Two minutes over. Um, well then, well let me try, okay, three minutes will do it. So here, <laughs> two, that'll be five. Okay, so I've made some scattered remarks about quantum theory, and I hope it is rather persuasive of my case that the world is in a more or less uncontroversial sense, made of quantum fields and hence quantities. But the measurement paradox afflicts the recovery of anything like the world that we see in the mathematical formalism. So if the measurement paradox is important, and I think it is, it's controversial after all. Okay, I want to make only a single observation. It is that the one essential feature of the micro-macro interface in quantum theory is that it is mathematically studied in decoherence theory, and the latter, from the point of view of those of us who uphold the universal validity of the unitary formalism, has a simple and striking feature. It is that the quantum state for sufficiently complex systems can be written as a superposition of states which unitarily evolves in such a way that terms in the superposition, superposition going from one time to the next satisfy approximately classical equations of motion. So I, can, do I have, perhaps in the question and answer I can show this on the board. So you've got a set of states, superposition state here, state here, state here, state here. Next instant of time you've got it again. Read the states as sequences. What you do is you turn a sequence of superpositions 
into a superposition of sequences. So a time sequence of superpositions, read it as a superposition of time sequences. <clears throat> now this is the so-called quantum histories formalism and specifically the, the quasi-classical domain where these histories satisfy equations. <clears throat> so it's not just the fact that the equations are paramount in deriving classical structure from quantum mechanics. It's that if we push this line of thinking, the, the, the business, the construction of complex phenomena out of simple ones becomes much more like the construction out of a, of a complex system of equations out of simple equations. How do equations coexist with one another? <clears throat> I find that a very interesting and different point of view, uh, but again, evidence for my quantity realism. To return one final time to the Tractatus, Wittgenstein's preface made much of the final lines of the book, concluding, of that which we cannot speak, we should pass over in silence. The book really was intended to draw a limit to language, a limit, perhaps, that he could only show. He emphasized a limit to language and not thought, because it was easy to pass the limit in language. Language just becomes meaningless or turns into philosophy. But it is not so obvious that thought can cease to be thought or become meaningless thought and still count as thought. But if quantity realism is correct, then it is fairly easy to go beyond language, study mathematics. And if it is thought about the world that is wanted that is not linguistic, study the mathematics of the quantities used in theories and measurements. Then, in Maxwell's lovely words, it is not a mere piece of knowledge that we have obtained. We have acquired the rudiment of a permanent mental endowment. Thank you. Thank you.